previously on Music In My Shoes. I'm going to go back to 1981 when you 2 released an album called October. We're going to move over to Leonard Skinner. The band was flying from Greenville, South Carolina to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Talking Heads, you know, they were always different with everything that they did. The Ramones, their fourth album, came out in 1978, Road to Ruin. And I'm not even sure if you've heard the song yet, but Libertines have a new single out, Run, Run, Run. Hey everybody, I'm glad you could join us today. I'm Jim Boge, and you're listening to Music in My Shoes. I'm thrilled to be here, and as always, that was Vic Thrill kicking us off here on episode three. I'd like to start the show off today by thanking everyone who has listened to episodes one and two. While the majority of our listeners are here in the United States, we also have followers in Europe and Asia. I'd like to say hello to all the people that listen to the podcast in Sweden, Germany, and the Philippines. Thank you, and I mean that. I continue to get feedback from listeners regarding some of the clips from the first two episodes. As you heard, Leonard Skinner, U2, Talking Heads, the Ramones, and the Libertines are some of the more popular that people comment on. I'm glad that people are revisiting or hearing things for the first time because, as we say, learn something new or remember something old. So speaking of something old, I'm going to go back to 1978. going to talk about Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell album. So that actually was released in 1977, but it didn't really start to take off until 1978, which is 45 years ago. A couple of the songs that were hits were You Took the Words Right Out of My Mouth, Two Out of Three Ain't Bad, and then Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Now, I will tell you, back in 1978, everywhere you went, you would hear Meatloaf. You would hear one of those songs on the radio, and it was Top 40, it was Rock Stations, it was my next-door neighbor's car, it was their house. It seemed like they played Meatloaf all of the time. Some of the things about Paradise by the Dashboard Light that makes it a really good song is that there's four parts to the song. First part is Paradise. Second part is the baseball broadcast. Third is Stop Right There. And then the fourth is Praying for the End of Time. So if you've not heard the song before, part two, baseball broadcast, is actually Phil Rizzuto, who is a former New York Yankees player, as well as a broadcaster. And he actually did the whole thing of announcing sort of a a person up at bat and what he was able to do and so forth, and they incorporated it into the song. Now, Phil Rizzuto really didn't know what he was recording. He didn't know it was going to be in a rock and roll song. He knew that he was just doing something to do it. And a great job by him with that, because that definitely makes the song part of what it is. So I talked about the fourth part, Praying for the End of Time. In the late 80s, I had a friend that he and his girlfriend were always listening to Paradise by the Dashboard Light. They even played it at their wedding, each pretending to be the male and female lead singers. I remember them singing the line, I'm praying for the end of time. And after a few years went by, they really were praying for the end of time. The album was produced by Todd Rundgren. So who is Todd Rundgren? He sang the song, Bang the Drum All Day. I don't want to work, I want to bang the drum all day. It's celebrating 40 years since its release. It's one of those songs that radio stations will play at 5 o'clock on Fridays, celebrating that the weekend is here. He's also produced two Grand Funk Railroad albums. Do you remember We're an American Band? He also produced Forever Now by the Psychedelic Furs with the songs Love My Way, President Gas, and Danger. For the song Love My Way, He brought in Flo and Eddie, who originally were singers in the 60s group The Turtles. 
You may remember their big hit of Happy Together, Imagine Me and You. So he brought them in to sing background vocals, and even though Richard Butler of the Psychedelic Furs thought it was finished, Todd thought it needed something else, and he had them do the background vocals. Go listen to the song, and when you listen to it, it's really hard not to think about Flo and Eddie singing, especially as it gets towards the end of the song. They really add a lot to it. So a lot of the themes for me are around 40 years ago, 1983 or so. Uh, It's hard to mention that year and not mention Michael Jackson's Thriller album. It's the second biggest selling album of all time, and it spawned the hits Want to Be Starting Something, The Girl Is Mine, a duet with Paul McCartney, Thriller, Beat It, and Billie Jean. When Michael performed on Motown 25, Yesterday, Today, Forever... I was one of the 47 million people watching him moonwalk during his performance of Billie Jean. Watch the video. It will make you wonder how can someone bend and contort their body and dance like that. It's absolutely incredible watching it. I forgot that he was able to do stuff like that. Get a chance, put it on, and see what it's all about. So in 1983, if you went to a fair or a carnival and you won a prize from doing some sort of, you know, game or something, everything was a Michael Jackson poster or a Michael Jackson shirt or Michael Jackson this, that, or the other. Top 40 radio played his songs nonstop. So a lot of times, you know, at the top of the hour, Top 40 would play, you know, the hit by one singer, and then they played the next hour and so forth. They were playing Michael Jackson, you know, four, five, six songs during the hour. How could you not like beat it with Eddie Van Halen supplying the guitar solo? So that was an excellent song. At the time, they didn't come out and say it was Eddie Van Halen because back in the day, you didn't really say, hey, I'm playing on someone else's album the way that they do today. But we all thought it was, and then finally we found out that it was the truth and it was Eddie Van Halen. So Michael Jackson Mania... It's similar to what Taylor Swift mania is today. Probably not as big. Taylor Swift definitely has crazy mania. The Swiffers, Swifties, I always get it wrong with what they are, but they're definitely dedicated to her. And I will say about Taylor Swift, you know, I've said this since I first heard her, is that she writes her own music, she plays her own music, She's a real person, and while I don't necessarily listen to a lot of it, I'm always impressed by people that can do their own thing and don't have to wait and have somebody else do it. I saw pictures of a costume party, and one in particular caught my eye. Paris Hilton dressed as Britney Spears in the Toxic video from 20 years ago. She had the blue flight attendant outfit on, and pulled it off well. Hey, Jimmy, do you remember that video? I think so. It was, it was it sort of like a, uh, I don't know, like a belly dancer kind of a look. Well, so there was multiple things. They were in a plane at one point, and she was had a blue flight attendant uh, outfit on. And then another part, she had this different outfit on that she was kind of doing this dancing type thing and so forth. It sounds like you really like this video, Jim. I do like the video. I'm not going to lie. I like Britney Spears, okay? I have liked her. I, I like some of the songs that she sings. But I find it hard to believe that 20 years has gone by since this song has come out. I mean, 20 years is a yeah. long time considering it's Britney Spears. I know on this show we talk a lot about things that are 40 years ago or 45 years ago, 50, whatever it may be. But to think 20 years with Britney Spears, that's like, wow, to right, me. Right, right, yeah. It's, it's like it's one thing to say the Ramones were 50 years ago. Like, yeah, okay, we get that. But Britney Spears was 20 years ago? Come on. Right, and she's much longer than that. I'm not sure when she started. I'm just talking about, you know, this particular song, Toxic. But speaking of 50 years ago, um, we'll do some recent releases that have come out. So Devo just released 50 Years of De-Evolution, a greatest hits. Um, They're on a tour now. They're saying it's their final tour. A great band, 
uh, you don't have to have listened to the album if you know Devo, because you know most of the songs that are on it. Jimmy, what do you think about Devo and their songs? Oh, I've always loved Devo. Uh, they are so unique. You know, nobody... It, it's a total concept band, the whole look and the, the backstory that they've got about devolution and everything. And uh, they've got really good music. Uh, you know, a lot of it's... The early stuff's kind of math rocky, you know. They got stuff in like seven, eight time signatures and stuff. And uh, then the the by the time they got to Freedom of Choice, it was like just they were just like a really good rock band. Yeah, Freedom of Choice is my favorite Devo song. Uh, I love that song. I cannot get enough of that. I could play it over and over and over. I love that album. It's got Gates of Steel on it. It's got Girl You Want on it. It was just like they were they were in their prime at that point. You know, some of the other songs, I remember, you know, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, the Rolling Stones cover. Mm-hmm. Now, the song is one thing. The video is a whole nother thing. It was absolutely insane at the time to see this video and just totally different than what anyone else was doing at the time. What was that video? I don't remember it. It had, like, people dancing, but in, like, a funkadelic style of of stuff, and the band was playing, and as they were playing, they were, like, kind of real stiff as they would play it, and yeah. it just was different. They weren't trying to uh, be up there and pose and be like, hey, look at me. You know, it was actually kind of quite the opposite and so forth. But, like, that, that song is a great example of Devo reimagining things and having their own angle completely. Like, the, the Stones' satisfaction is such a good groove, and they're so based on the blues, and, and it just, like, took all the blues out of that song and made it this very angular, you know, nerdy but <laughs> cool kind of a, a take on it. Yeah, I agree. You know, speaking of nerdy, the song Through Being Cool, that, to me, was a nerdy song, yet it was popular my friends and i we all listen to it they just have a way of taking nerdy things and saying hey here we are and you like it yeah and and you know the thing i didn't know until i listened to this new 50 year release they have is uh the song i'm a potato that they put on there as a demo they say it's from 1974 i think it was a i didn't know they were around in 1974 their first record came out in 78 so uh they, but they, it has a lot of the story of Devo built into it. It was very much a concept song. They had the whole idea back in 74, maybe 73. Yeah, and the fact that they're from Akron, Ohio, that they're not from, you know, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, mm-hmm. that they're Another Akron. Another planet. Right. Yeah. It's very like, they're from where? And the fact that they could just come out and they could put all this together, what was important to them. I think most of the listeners know, obviously everybody knows Whip It, you know, I think everybody of any age knows the song Whip It, but I think most listeners really will know the song Beautiful World. It's been in a lot of commercials, it's one of those songs that I don't think people know it's Devo, but that is as commercial as can be, yet you don't know it's them, and how is that possible? You would think if it's super commercial, you would know right away. But I find that that's not the case. Yeah, but it's also, it's a subversive kind of lyrics in it because it's a beautiful world and it's a pretty song, but then he says, for you, it's not for me. Correct. But in the commercials, they don't always play that part. They don't play that part. <laughs> they, they, they leave that part out. Um, but, it, you know, I, I think one of the things with with any kind of good song, any kind of music... And this is the one thing, hey, I love sports, okay? But what I like about music more is the fact that there's no right or wrong, that it is about your interpretation of how someone's playing the instrument, your interpretation of the words, and how it makes you feel. And I think that Devo was like, we're going to do this, this is our interpretation, and we want people to know what our interpretation is of this. And you either like it or you don't like it. Yeah. And they never really budged from that, you know? I mean, even in nope. their later years with, you know, uh, when they were doing Peekaboo and That's Good, I mean, these were just, you know, 
funky, crazy songs that they would just still say, hey, we're going to do our way and, and, and enjoy it. I saw them in, in 2005. I saw them, they played at um, uh, Music Midtown. And my brother and I went to the show. And we got really close up to the front. And even though they were older, it was a great show. It was. I was there. Yeah, that was great. That was when it was over in Central Park where Shaky Knees is now. So in 1978, I remember walking to the record store with my next door neighbor, the person that used to rent me his 8-track player that we've <laughs> talked about previously. And it was a couple of miles away. And I remember walking with him. And I'm like, what are you getting? And he's like, we're going to buy the new Devo. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And we get to this record store, and they have posters all over, you know, are we not men? We are Devo. And we're buying this. And I'm like, no idea. Yeah. No idea whatsoever what we're getting ourselves into here. But he knew all about them. And that was my introduction to Devo back in, in 78, which was, uh, you know, that album. I'll never forget the walk. I mean, it <laughs> literally, it was um, in this shopping center uh, in East Meadow, not too far from the entrance of Eisenhower Park. And I was walking from Levittown. So for any of you listeners out there in New York, on Long Island, you can kind of get an idea of, of what I'm talking about. And I'm not sure why I agreed to walk, maybe because I thought I'd get a good deal on renting out the 8-track player <laughs> again or so forth. But wow, um, it definitely changed a lot because that's the day that I learned about Devo. Yeah, and that's how you had to learn about a band in 1978. You had to have somebody that knew about them. Unless it, unless it was Top 40 Music, which Devo was not, then you, you had to have a cool person that maybe was taking advantage of you renting your eight tracks, and, and they told you about the cool bands. But if he did not take advantage of me, I wouldn't know as many of the bands that I know now. That was worth it. It was, it was definitely worth it. I can say that for sure. So let's move on to the Rolling Stones' Hackney Diamonds, Last episode, we discussed Bite My Head Off with guest Paul McCartney on bass, but let's dig into the rest of the album. So it's the first album of original music in 18 years. Last uh, album that they had was 2005's Bigger Bang. I really like it. Um, I, I've enjoyed it. I've listened to it multiple times. I've listened to it where I'm just listening to it, and I've listened to it as background music. And I've... I'm digging it. I really am. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good album. It really is. It's a couple of the uh, the songs that stand out. The first song, Angry. I like that song. Get Close. It's got Piano by Elton John. Depending on You. Keyboards and Piano by Ben Montench from The Heartbreakers, from Tom Petty and The Heartbreakers. Hmm. Song, Whole Wide World. And then Dreamy. That's a good one. Yes, it is. It, it, it's a real good one. Dreamy Skies. To me, it sounds like it could be a song on any album from the Rolling Stones from 68 to 72. I think the guitar is vintage Rolling Stones. Really like Dreamy Skies a lot. Yeah, there's some songs that kind of have that uh, exile era sound, and then there's some that, you know, like, oh, that's a little bit more like the Some Girls or... or uh, Tattoo You or something. You know, they, they did a good job of kind of having some different Stones eras feeling in these songs. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, Live by the Sword. The, I love this song. I think it's a fantastic song, but it also has Elton John on piano, Bill Wyman on bass, and Charlie Watts on drums. Oh, cool. And having something that they were able to record before uh, Charlie Watts died is fantastic. But also getting Bill Wyman, the old bass player for the Rolling Stones, on it. You know, I love stuff like that. That, to me, is just putting everything back, you know, as much as you could to get the band back together. Yeah. I love it. I heard an a interview with Mick and... They, he said he called Bill Wyman up and he was like, hey, I don't know if you play anymore. And Bill's like, what are you talking about? I play every day. So he, he was in good shape to play. 
And that's a good thing, you know, because I think sometimes we forget, you know, off the top of my head, Mick Jagger, I think, is 81. I think Keith Richards is 79. And Ron Wood is the the baby at 76. You know, it's not easy for them to play. It really isn't no. easy at all. I've read on a couple of articles where Keith Richards has, uh, you know, arthritis that's making it difficult to play for him. Speaking of Keith Richards, he sings a song, Tell Me Straight, lead vocals. I think it's a real good song. I think he hasn't had a real good song like that in a really long time. And I feel like he puts a lot of effort into it and that he really wanted it to be good. And I think it comes across that way. Yeah. So that's uh, it's good to see that, you know. Uh, and he sounds good because, you know, on some tours— when he's played his songs live, it hasn't always been good. You know, he's yeah. forgotten some of the words, or maybe not some, you maybe know, pe- a lot. People have to use the restroom at Stone's concerts too, Jim. That is true. You know when to go. Sweet Sounds of Heaven with Lady Gaga. So before I talk about that, I'm going to just mention Stevie Wonder plays the piano and the keyboards. What do you think of that song, Jimmy? Oh, it's a good song, yeah. It's, uh, I kept waiting for Stevie Wonder's voice to come in, but I don't think he sings. He just does the piano. I thought his voice was going to come in also, mm-hmm. but yeah, he's just doing the piano and the keyboards. I think, even without Lady Gaga, that that would be a good song. And I'm not t- disrespecting Lady Gaga. I think it's a real good song. When I first listened to it and the beginning, it captured my my attention, and I was listening, and then Lady Gaga comes in, and I think at some points, they, you know, her vocals might be a little too loud. And again, that's my interpretation. It's the way that I feel, kind of what I just talked about a few minutes ago. Mm-hmm. I think it's a good song, but I think that they could have done it themselves and it would still be a really good song. It would, yeah. And I think it, it works with their age. Like uh, anybody that's in their 80s or late 70s like them, you know, the other guys— has lost a lot of people. I mean, people our age have lost people, but it it is amazing that they're able to use their platform and their voice and articulate, uh, you know, a song of loss and a song of, of a song coming from heaven. I mean, I don't know exactly where the lyrics come from or, or who they're referring to, but it feels super authentic when Mick is singing that, that you feel like, okay, yeah, he's... He's lost some folks, and uh, he's putting a positive spin on it. Yeah, and that's why right from the beginning when I heard it, because I can feel that emotion that I was like, this is a good song. You Mm -hmm. know, I really like songs you feel the emotion. I've talked about it before. And I think that them being able to do this album, not dial it in, I think every song is pretty good. Hey, it's an album. Not every song is going to be great. But for the ages that they are, I really think they did a good job of putting it together and playing and getting some good guests to be with them to make something real positive. And then I really like the last song because they're paying respects to their blues roots with a cover of Muddy Waters' Rolling Stone Blues. The Rolling Stones have always been about being the blues And they have never forgotten that. And if you listen to them throughout their career, they always go back and revisit many of their live albums. They'll get, you know, people from back in the day, have them on their albums. They've gone, you know, in 81, I think they went to Muddy Waters Club in uh, Chicago and they did a, um, like a, not a concert, but it was just like a little tiny club and they performed with him and it was fantastic. They actually released it um, you can get it. The sound quality is not the best, but it's kind of a piece of history, and and I really like that. And I really, I appreciate the Rolling Stones never forgetting where they came from and that whole bluesy thing. And you can listen, and I can name a ton of songs. We could be here all day talking about just that part of what they do. But the fact that they have this album, we don't know if they'll have another one. And the last song is, you know, Rolling Stone Blues. Yeah. I I think that's pretty cool. I really do. The majority of critics' reviews have been positive. I've read a lot of reviews on this album. 
and people are saying it's the best album since Tattoo You, which came out in 1981. Another great album. I love that album. I know we're not talking about it, but I like the trifecta of Some Girls, Emotional Rescue, Tattoo You. Yeah. And then to have people say that this is the next best album since then, I think that that's pretty cool. Because, again, it goes to show how much effort that they actually put into making the album, not just a couple of songs, but the whole entirety. Yep. So Pitchfork felt differently. And first, let me say, I love Pitchfork. I read a lot of articles by Pitchfork. I get a lot of information from them. I really do enjoy reading things that they put out. But they definitely felt differently because I'll quote, exactly the sort of album you give a middle-aged, mid-divorced dad who's flailing for direction in his post-split sports car. They talk a lot about how it's not vintage Rolling Stones. It's not the way that the Rolling Stones were. And I think that you can't really take a look at what the Rolling Stones were and say that, yeah, this is this versus that because of what their ages are. We all grow older. We all can't do what we used to do. We all have different thoughts and and can't be what we were. And why would we want them to just put out a rehash? You know, it, it, to me, it sounds enough. It sounds like the Rolling Stones. They're they're breaking some new ground. I agree with you. I, I mean, I really, truly do. You don't want to, you know, you don't want them putting out some sort of, you know, Jumpin' Jack Flash 2023 version. <laughs> right. Y- you want them to be putting out some some new stuff. So the the dubstep version of uh, right. <laughs> Jumpin' uh, Jack. That's Flash. not what we need. I think the album is a truthful album, and it shows the flaws. And the flaws, I don't mean mistakes. I mean, it just shows that as we get older, we can't sing the way we once did. We can't play the guitar the way we once did. Just the things that we were talking about that you don't want to rehash. You want to break new ground, do new things. And the flaws are, we're getting older, and we're not going to live forever but we're going to put something out there for you to listen to. So the article ends with, just like the image of its title, Hackney Diamonds isn't all full of rad gems. It is instead the mess made in the attempt to get easy money from somebody else. And I just find that crazy. Um, Yeah. Absolutely. I'm sure the Rolling Stones are hurting for money. They really had to just, you know, get some checks in the mail here. Well, Come on. I, I agree. But this is the ironic part. So under this digital article, it displays the album with pricing. So you can actually buy it at the end of this article. In italic print, it says all products found on Pitchfork are independently selected by our editors. However, when you buy something through our retail links, we may earn an affiliate (laughs) commission. (laughs) And... I find that hysterical. I've screenshot it. Yeah. I keep looking at it. I laugh at it. Mm-hmm. Hey, at the end of the day, everybody's trying to make money. That's what business is all about. But to kind of have this article and really be negative towards the Rolling Stones and in the end saying it's all about money and then selling the album right below where you just click on it and that Pitchfork is going to now make money off of it, that is ironic. And again... I do like Pitchfork, okay? I just want to make that clear to people. I enjoy reading it. I was just really surprised by this one article. I haven't seen many articles, anything like it. So it really has captured my eye. And the ironic part has really stayed with my brain. And it gives me a good chuckle whenever I need one. Yeah. (laughs) So the Beatles have released a new song, Now and Then. And it had been rumored that it was going to be coming out. It has finally come out. Um, It's a double A side with their first single, Love Me Do. And basically, it is a cassette recording that John Lennon made in the late 1970s at the Dakota in New York City where he lived. Yoko Ono had given three songs to the rest of the Beatles to see if they could make some songs out of them. The first being Free as a Bird, which was released in 1995, Real Love, which was released in 1996, 
And then this last song, Now and Then, that they just couldn't make a good song out of it, just because of the way it was on the cassette recording, the piano that John Lennon played was a lot louder than his vocals, and the technology at the time couldn't separate it for them to be able to do anything with it. Now, with today's technology, they were able to go in and separate the tracks and be able to raise up the voice of John Lennon so that they could do something with it. Have you heard it yet, Jimmy, before I talk about it more? Yes, yeah, I thought it was really good. I have mixed emotions about it. I think it's a good song, but I struggle with, like, it doesn't seem as Beatle-ish as most of the Beatles songs that have come out. Yeah. To me, it's a John Lennon song Mm -hmm. that they tried to jump in and make it like a Beatles song. But I don't think, I'm not sure that it comes off that way. It's also going to be on the reissued version of the Blue Album, 1967 to 70, that they're re-releasing. They're also re-releasing 62 to 66. The Red and the Blue Albums, as we call them. And I believe those came out in 1973, 50 years ago, as a matter of fact. The ones with them looking over the uh, balcony of a building and, and on one of them... They, yes. They're clean, clean-faced, and the other one, they have their big, long beards and everything. That is correct, and I think that they used one of the shots from the film that they did for Please Please Me album. So I think mm. the younger one is kind of from that time, and then they went back and they did that, that second one, like you said, for the Blue album. And when I was younger, everybody had those albums. But they've added this song to, to the Blue album, And I like it. I've listened to it multiple times. Again, it's a good song, but it's not a Beatles song to me. Now, Free as a Bird, I think that's a Beatles song. When I listen to Free as a Bird, even though John Lennon wrote that song, it, to me, is a Beatles song. Real Love is a little less Beatles-ish because I had actually heard that. I had a copy of it back in the... Um, the late 80s, I had gotten a copy of it. So I've always heard it just as a John Lennon song. And when the Beatles joined up into it, I could, you know, I could handle it. I could take what they had done with it. I'm struggling a little bit here with Now and Then. I like the words. Well, I'll tell you, I liked it. I thought it definitely doesn't sound like it was a Beatles song recorded in the 60s. It sounds like, like you said, a John Lennon song but it's got that really melancholy, the way that John's songwriting progressed to. It's refreshing to to hear, you know, what's to me a new song from him and to have the Beatles on there. So I think of it more that way. Like, it's it's a John Lennon song that the Beatles played on. And I think, for me, if they released it as a John Lennon song and they didn't have the Beatles on it, I think that I would be like, man, that's a great song. Yeah. I really like that song. And I think I'm struggling with John Lennon versus the Beatles in what it is. The last thing I'll leave you with while I'm thinking of it is if you listen to it again, it's like the first song that Ringo Starr really has his vocals, background vocals elevated. You can clearly hear Ringo Starr, and that's definitely different for the Beatles. And I think Ringo Starr, his voice, not that it was ever great, but it hasn't changed at all from where it was in the 60s, whereas Paul's voice has changed a little bit over time as he's gotten older, as does with most of us. Right. Hey, listen, I appreciate everyone listening. That's it for this episode of Music in My Shoes. I'd like to thank Jimmy Guthrie, as always. I do appreciate all of the feedback and how people love having Jimmy on the show and his uh, commenting on new albums and all old albums, all the things that we talk about. Arcade 160 Studios in Atlanta. He's the owner. That's where we are. I want to thank Vic Thrill for our podcast music, and I'm hoping you learned something new or remembered something old. And until next time, this is Jim Boge. Take care. <laughs>